After Foodie's last video about her trip to the ER, I think many of us were left with more questions than answers, so I called in the big guns. In this video, I gave an update to my buddy Dr. X, who happens to be an emergency room physician. Before I started recording, I did refresh his memory about Foodie's comorbidities, but he is already familiar with her because, you know, earlier videos. Just remember, the things we discuss in this video are for entertainment purposes only. It's just two friends talking about things like DKA, sciatica, you know, fun stuff. Hello, Dr. X. It is good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you again. Okay, so since we last talked, a lot has happened. Um, so we're talking about Foodie Beauty in her last trip back home to Canada in December of 2023. She went to the ER for high blood sugar symptoms like dizziness and vision blurriness and all that. Um, and they gave her insulin. She is currently on Janumet, which is an extended release metformin with something else added to it. Um, and in December, she got a couple of units of IV fluid with some insulin. They asked her to try eating a muffin. She wouldn't do it. She didn't want to eat. Um, and then they sent her home. So this recent episode, she just came back and said that she was just in the ER for norovirus. And we're all confused because she said that she got six liters or six units of IV solution, which looked like one liter bags. Um, and that she was there sort of, she said she was there for a full day, but we don't know if it was a full 24 hours. Um, and she didn't really talk about anything else that they gave her, but she did say that they monitored her, monitored her heart rate and her blood sugar because her blood sugar was high again. But she didn't give us a number. She didn't tell us what other medications they gave her for this supposed norovirus. Um, and we're just wondering if it could have been you know, more likely diabetes related. It, I know it's impossible to tell without talking to her, but I guess our first question is, what's the standard for somebody who comes in with vomiting and diarrhea for a certain number of hours? You know, like how could you possibly lead to a norovirus diagnosis? Yeah, so there, I mean, there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, she, in the past, she put her labs up on the screen, right? And has, has done that, but I guess yeah. not for this one. Correct. Um, uh, norovirus certainly is still going around. Um, we saw a peak of it, and I think the CDC put out something that, for the U.S. Um, earlier this winter. And so there have been a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrheal illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, in a healthy person without a bunch of comorbidities. Uh, typically, it's a short ER stay. Um, you get one or two or possibly three liters of fluid. You help control their nausea. And um, then they're able to go home. You send them home on anti-nausea medicine. As long as somebody's able to keep fluids down, mm -hmm. uh, they're able to go home. Okay, so... One question about that is, in your ER, how long can a person be there? Like six units of normal saline, that would take a long time, right, to administer to somebody, wouldn't it? Well, yes, and um, six liters of fluid is like an extraordinary amount of fluid to give somebody. Yeah, that's what we were thinking. Um, sometimes we'll use weight-based boluses. So mm -hmm. 400 pounds is roughly 200 kilograms. It's slightly less than that. Um, and you will give 20 or 30 milliliters of fluid per kilogram. Um, so if we were using 220, um, that would be four liters of fluid as like an initial fluid resuscitation for some things mm -hmm. um it it doesn't really apply in the situation of just being dehydrated from norovirus it, um 
likely is more to that picture. And I can't imagine giving somebody six liters of fluid in a short amount of time. Um, when you give somebody a liter of fluid, about a third of that stays in their blood vessels and two thirds of it goes outside of their blood vessels into spaces between cells. Um, so total, that would have put like four liters of, you know, that would have made anybody swell uh, if, if given in a short amount of time. I mean, I, like I'm inferring that uh, she w would have been admitted for observation and mm -hmm. given a few more fluids of a few more liters of fluid. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, it sounds it's, like there's more to the story. Yeah, it sounds weird, right? Okay, so one thing we were thinking of, and this is, so on a personal basis, I had a kidney infection and I was dehydrated a few years ago. And I went to the ER because the urgent care sent me to the ER and said, let them know that you've probably got a kidney infection and this is what we think and we'll send your records over. And I ended up getting two liters with Rocephin and it took like two hours to give it to me. Yeah. And after two hours, they checked on me and said, okay, how are you feeling? And I felt much, much better. So they sent me home. So is that sort of how they do fluid therapy? Like you give a certain amount and you see how they're doing and you give another amount and you see how they're doing. I mean, we honestly think she's just exaggerating about the number of liters she got. Yeah. Um, that, that's a typical resuscitation. Um, two liters of fluid, um, or 30 milliliters per kilogram of body weight, uh, which for most people, like a, a 70 kilogram human, 150 pound human is two liters. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times we'll adjust that for somebody's ideal body weight. So, mm -hmm. so two liters is like a typical starting point. Um, if somebody's blood pressure is low after that, then, then potentially two more liters before starting, um, stuff to, to raise the blood pressure, you know, like her, other, other drugs. She did show us her monitors and her BP was fine. Um, the only thing it showed on the monitor that we could see was that it was like one, 109 over 60. It wasn't anything to write home about. So we think, <laughs> we think that it was more diabetes related and that it was sort of like the hyperglycemia that she had back in December where they probably gave her insulin because she did mention that her blood glucose was high, but she didn't give a number. So I guess there's really no way of knowing unless she tells us, right? Right. But what can happen, um, so if somebody has like poorly controlled diabetes, mm -hmm. um, gets a, an acute nausea, vomiting, diarrheal illness, gets a little bit dehydrated, uh, you, it's pretty easy depending on like how poorly controlled your diabetes is to go into diabetic ketoacidosis and, and then require some fluid resuscitation. But even then six liters in a short amount of time uh, is an extraordinary amount of fluid. What does real norovirus look like? Like how does it present? How do you treat it? And then how quickly does it go away? And is it really that contagious? One, yeah, it's, it's super contagious. Um, the, I don't know if you want to talk about this. The way it gets transmitted is, yeah, no, um, it's fine. It's okay. From the virus being shed in stool, mm -hmm. uh, ending up on somebody's hands, ending up on something else and then ending up on you, which is she, not nice to think about. No, but she makes regular stops to this outhouse. <laughs> yeah. And, um, she just not really well known for washing her hands, so yeah, that's yeah, awful. she's she's not yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. Um, so yeah, it's contagious. It presents typically starting with nausea and vomiting, and then crampy abdominal pain, and then diarrhea. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, they're fairly violent but short lived. Um, in some people, twelve hours. It can oh, really? Go out to seventy two hours. Okay. Um, uh, but it just causes a lot of inflammation in your gut, which dumps a lot of fluid in, which you vomit out and have diarrhea. Um, when somebody comes and sees me and I make a diagnosis of an acute nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, it could be norovirus or rotavirus mm -hmm. or, um, some other 
uh, like viral cause of vomiting and diarrhea, uh, our job is to control their nausea, make sure they can stay hydrated, um, mm -hmm. and then we just kind of have to let this run its course. Do you mask them if they're in the hospital and they have it, or do you just <laughs> tell them not to it, poop on it people? Typically, <laughs> would be a um, like a contact isolation and wash your hands really well with soap and water. Okay. Other than drinking regular water, what's a good option for staying hydrated? Because she can't have, you know, too much sugar. She can't. Do people recommend the Gatorades, the even like the lower calorie Gatorades, or is it more like natural stuff like coconut water? Or <laughs> well, the the biggest thing for her is going to be controlling her blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So the way that plays in is your your kidneys basically dump all of the fluid in your bloodstream, kind of outside of your body but within the kidney, and then pull it back in. Mm -hmm. um, and the way the that water travels with sugar, it mm -hmm. makes it very difficult for your body to pull water back in, and the sugar kind of keeps water in your urine, dehydrates you. Oh. Um, so f to stay hydrated, her biggest step is controlling her blood sugar. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And then, uh, it, you know, there's nothing. It, water, but whatever other electrolytes there's i don't think there's a ton of science behind it yeah but but yeah avoiding anything with sugar in it gotcha okay so let's leave the bag discussion off to the side another thing that has happened that you don't know about yet is that she thinks she's developed sciatica and because of that she doesn't really leave the house and she doesn't walk she doesn't swim she doesn't do any of the things that we talked about and she's sort of using it as an excuse to sort of what she calls bed rot. So the big question there was, is it diabetic neuropathy? Is it really sciatica? If it was sciatica, who would diagnose it and how would they diagnose it? And what would they do about sciatica for somebody like that? Um, so any, any one of our physicians, I mean, sciatica is just radicular back pain, like radiating down a leg, right. um, which is very common. Um, You've got a, your sciatic nerve runs out of your lower back through a couple of canals and then down your leg. And mm -hmm. so if it gets pinched or irritated at any of those points along it, you'll get sciatica. Right. Um, so it's not, um, you know, a, a family physician, uh, any, anybody could have diagnosed it. Um, that's it. So when I diagnose that, mm -hmm. I talk a lot to people about the physical aspect of fixing whatever has caused that nerve to be pinched, um, like like doing stretches and core exercises mm. to kind of stabilize your spine and um, all of the muscles that run from your spine to your hip, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to doing medicine. Um, a lot of times we catch people, you know, they will have tried to deal with this, but it hurts so much that they can't do a lot of activity and we'll catch them two weeks down the road. And that's tough because the longer you're inactive with that, the more it hurts and the mm -hmm. harder it becomes to kind of reverse that cycle. Um, we've talked before about she's in a tough spot and, and mm -hmm. um, I think that that just kind of adds Okay, I feel, like, <laughs> I feel yeah. like you're tiptoeing around what you really want to say, that she has appeared in other videos since then walking around, walking on the beach. She recently flew back to Canada with a connection in Frankfurt. So she is able to walk. She just kind of doesn't want to, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I, t I take a, a little bit different approach as somebody who's had back pain intermittently and had some severe back pain um, over like the last 12 years. Uh, I, I really try to focus on the, the physical aspect of rehabbing your spine and your hips mm -hmm. and, um, and stretching. Uh, uh, but then also, um, you know, we, we give our initial medications in the ER um, uh, and send them home with some form of muscle relaxer, some form of pain control. Uh, oh, like what? Because she is looking for medication for it. Well, for me, I, 
I don't use things stronger for mm -hmm. sciatic symptoms than Tylenol, ibuprofen, gabapentin, mm -hmm. um, and all of the like other NSAIDs and sometimes oh. steroids. But for her, I would not use steroids yeah. because of like the blood sugar. Don't forget issues. though, she also has um, kidney issues. Yeah, and then of course the liver stuff. And so she's just been kind of popping NSAIDs like candy. And she was talking about wanting to try to get pain medication and I don't know. It's a mess. Yeah. Um, I, I could imagine for the doctor on the other end, it being a tough visit to, to figure out a good regimen that, that actually helps her in the long term. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's, it's easy enough to give somebody Percocet or oxycodone or even something stronger, uh, and mask the pain mm -hmm. for, for some amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but in the long run, it's not. But really. to, yeah, to, yeah, what's what really would help her in the long run is is the physical stuff. Yeah. Uh, either going through physical therapy, um, and then seeing a spine specialist. Uh, oh yeah. For imaging, right? And just to see if <laughs> yeah if it's a real thing. I mean, it could be a real. She could have a real thing that she needs. Yeah. To address. Yeah. We really do appreciate your time, by the way. Um, <laughs> another thing that came up was that in a close-up shot of her holding this little piece of chocolate, her thumbnails or her fingernails seem to be clubbing, like pretty bad, like looking pretty bulbous. And what could clubbing of the fingers indicate? Well, so clubbing is typically I have to I have to see a picture of her. But it's typically related to like long term smoking and, and COPD stuff. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, she does smoke shisha and she vapes and she smokes pot and yeah. all of that. Okay, so let's talk about DKA. When you say DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, a lot of us don't really understand what that means. Like, it sounds like this big scary thing that we've been told can lead to coma. Um, cause we also talked to Dr. K in internal medicine and he said that DKA is something she really needs to worry about if she can't control her sugars. Is DKA something that happens and can be fixed and then it just starts happening more frequently or is it a just worst case scenario and then boom, really, really bad stuff starts to happen. Yeah. So, so backing up a little bit, diabetes is your cells are saying we have enough sugar inside we are not going to absorb more sugar in response to the insulin that you're producing and so your sugar black backs up into your bloodstream mm. um when you don't have enough insulin to overpower that your metabolism starts um like stops using glucose which is the uh, ketones your body starts releasing these from your muscles and your fat and um, and they circulate in your bloodstream, your blood sugar goes up further. Uh, and part of using ketones is that you produce acid, which your body can buffer for some time. And then eventually it, like your blood becomes acidic, mm -hmm. um, and becomes acidic too quickly for your, your body to compensate for it. Uh, so if how does that manifest? Like what? Because a so, lot of people are saying it's similar to norovirus. Some of the symptomology yeah. is the same, and yeah. so that's why it could have been DKA, but she's masking it. I mean, yeah. Um, so I, it, it starts with with you feeling awful, um, and then yeah, you can have nausea, vomiting, fatigue. Typically, people um, because your blood sugars up you you end up peeing out a lot of extra fluids you feel very dehydrated um that's typically what we see is some combination of vomiting fatigue a high heart rate dehydration so dka is like a few steps beyond hyperglycemia then like if you don't treat the hyperglycemia and it could get worse 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 until it turns into a dka situation yeah, there's um, like two main complications of high blood sugar, uh, 
the acute complications of high blood sugar, DKA, and then something called HHS, which um, your, your bloodstream just basically has so much sugar in it that uh, like you, you get confused and have altered mental status and mm. um, are very dehydrated at the same time, but are not, don't have that acid component. Like the, the high ketones whose metabolism leads to oh, acid. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm going to end this interview the way I did last time. If she presented in your ER, and let's say it was norovirus, right? And you saw these numbers, you saw the weight, you saw the unmanaged type 2 diet. I mean, the unmanaged T2 is obvious, right? Like, it's going to be obvious from the fasting blood sugar being so high because she said that she wasn't able to eat, really. She was vomiting she had the diarrhea so she presented to the er and her blood sugar was still high so it's got to be really bad if it, she's presenting and it's still high after fasting right what would you say to her upon discharge so always when we walk into a room um in the back of our mind as an as an er physician is where is this person going to end up are they going to end up going home uh admitted to the hospital to an icu um are they acutely ill or not and I have a feeling from, from the doorway or from the initial vital signs or from her initial labs, it's going to be obvious that she's going into the hospital. So I, I probably wouldn't be handling her discharge summary. Um, wait, wait, wait. You mean if she presented with, quote, quote, norovirus, you would probably admit her? I Yeah, with her with her comorbidities and her general health status, I, mm. I don't see a way, you know, I, I wasn't there, but I don't see a way that you'd be thinking you, this is a person I'm going to send home. Um, but I, there's a chance. That, I mean, she left. Yeah. They, she said they discharged her overnight for this dehydration she said that it, she was basically treated for dehydration and she left yeah there's a, there's a chance that after she got some medicine she looked great and felt great and wanted to go home but i just can't you know i'm a little bit suspicious that that was the case yeah no we all are that's the thing because this i mean and the thing is it's a canadian healthcare system right so her emr has to be in there they have to know that she did this in december and that she was admitted to the ER for hyperglycemia. She got XYZ. And what is it now? Six months later, her diabetes is still pretty much unmanaged, right? She hasn't been put on insulin other than what she gets in the ERs. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess that's the question is what, what now you tell her you have to go see an endocrinologist or, you know. Yeah, I, I just can't imagine that... Um that the information that you're being presented with is Everything. the same as what her doctors would be suggesting that she does. I think somebody with unmanaged type 2 diabetes who gets six liters of fluid, there's no way that a physician is telling them it's, it's time to go home after that. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'll answer your question, but I just think it's like, it doesn't likely. seem like a realistic scenario. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, um, well, that's what we think, too. <laughs> uh, that's what we think, too. I, I mean, I would have the same... I, I have this talk with a lot of patients that, that I'm seeing at, at for, like, a, you know, they come in because their, their blood pressure is uncontrolled, or they come in and, and it's a new diagnosis or diabetes, or their diabetes is out of control for the first time. Um, I, I have a hard time. I don't take like a very paternalistic approach, like telling them exactly what you want to do. I just tell them what I see people go through. Um, if it's diabetes and typically they'll know somebody who's had bad diabetes, but you know, if I see them at, at 40 years old, you know, if, if you want to have a life at 65 or 70 where you're active, where you're chasing around grandkids or you're having the retirement that you'd like to have, um, that diabetes can't really be a part of that. Uh, yeah. That retirement looks like, you know, managing doctor's visits and, and then 
down the road if it's poorly controlled, like getting toes chopped off or getting amputations even higher than that and then losing your vision and having heart attacks and strokes and ending up in a skilled nursing facility laying in bed all day until they decide to ship you to the ER and then you get hospital, you know. It, yeah. it just is not the kind of life that anybody would want. And I tell them what I see, you know, and then it's always, and in, in, you know this and we've talked about this, and it's always up to the person to make the change. There's nothing yeah. you can do to force them to, to make a change. So a lot of us feel like we're watching a movie <laughs> and the same thing happens over and over again and we can see where it's going. Like a lot of us who work in healthcare can see where this is going, either from professional experience or personal experience. Like, so it's frustrating, but um, is there anything else you want to add to the viewers? Well, I, I also, part of that discussion is like, um, that if you want to avoid all those things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, and strokes and heart attacks with either your high blood pressure or your diabetes. Um, I don't know if I want to put this on the internet, but uh, I tell them if I could choose between the world's best physicians, a team of them, looking at every single number every day and dedicated just to her care and getting paid very well to do it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a, a situation where you can optimize your health care and have complete access, or a situation where you adopt a healthy lifestyle, you exercise every day, you eat healthy, you lose weight, you de-stress. Um, if I have to bet who's going to have the best life at 80 years old, I'm taking the latter every yeah. time. So. Don't say de-stress because <laughs> she thinks that the solution to de-stressing is what she calls bed rotting. And she thinks that staying home and resting the sciatica is best. And <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I get it. I do some YouTube rot. <laughs> not not watching the same thing, but watch it some fishing shows. No, you need to watch the video I did about the ERBs. Um, but thank you very much, Dr. X. We really appreciate your time. And make sure you look at the comments. People always want you to look at the comments. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll check them out. You okay. send it to me. Thank you.